Welcome everybody. My name is Gypsy. Um, I'm joined by Grace and Yifan. Do you want to introduce yourselves or say hi? Hi, I'm Grace. I'm, I'm, I'm Yifan. Hello everyone. And welcome to our talk. So our talk is titled From Boxes to Polynomials and it's going to be a story of generalization. So I want you to keep that theme in mind. We're going to start with something quite small, quite specific, and then we're going to end up with something almost unrecognizable from the, from the beginning. Um, so without further ado, let's go for it. So this is the kind of plan for today. We'll start with humble beginnings with the integer version. Now, you're probably thinking the integer version of what? Well, you'll, you'll see, you'll see in the next slide. We're gonna start with a version of something, what we're gonna call the theorem. We're gonna upgrade once to the polynomial version, then to the elliptic version. And finally, we're gonna see how this kind of whole thing fits in within the field of McDonald polynomials. So let's look at the integer version. What are we doing? Well, the goal of the first section of the talk is to understand the following theorem. Right? And this theorem is gonna be a basis for all these upgrades, these elliptic versions, you know, this McDonald polynomials, this polynomial version, and the, this integer version. So I know this looks quite scary right now, but it's supposed to look quite scary because you don't know what any of this means. Well, you might know a couple of things. So first, it's going to be an equality. So we're going to have something equal to something else. Second, um, this, this big pi symbol here means product, which is multiplication. So on the left-hand side, we're going to have a whole bunch of things multiplying together. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have a whole bunch of things multiplying together. And hopefully, in the end, if everything goes to plan, they're equal to each other, right? And this is our theorem. There's the product over the boxes. And we don't know what a box is yet, but you know, the product over the boxes over you know, this kind of thing here, n plus the content of the box divided by the hook of the box is equal to the product over, we don't have boxes here. We have this weird, what we call an iterator, one less equal to i, less than j, less than equal to n, over kind of these symbols here. Now, again, I'm not expecting you to know any, what any of this means, but the goal of the whole talk is the kind of so you can understand what it means, right? So this formula is amazing. So get quite excited. Um, but let's do it. So first we introduce the idea of a box. So boxes. Take a list of non-increasing numbers and you get a stack of boxes. So for instance, we have this list two, 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 one, and it gives us the, the diagram over here with rows two, 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 one. Right? And you can do a little pattern match, right? So these numbers just correspond to these rows. Another example, this three, two, one, and another four, two, two, all right? So that's all I mean when I say boxes. We take a list of numbers. Now, of course, if we want to refer to each box, we'll need to index them. That is, we want to give them a kind of a name. Um, if you're familiar with, matrix, with matrices and matrix indexing, it's, it's the same thing. So we see over here, A, this corresponds to the coordinate one, one, which you can just read off this key on the left and the top. This B, two, three, oh, sorry, this B, four, two, and the C, two, three, and, and so on, right? So we're just giving all these boxes a name. And this will kind of help us when we try to explain our theory, uh, theorem later. All right, so we've got the indexing. And finally, I mean, we wanna do something about the rows. Now it's not obvious why we wanna do something about the rows, but this is actually these lambda i's I was talking about. So given a stack of boxes, lambda, we have the number of boxes in row i equal to lambda i. And note, this aligns nicely with our list of numbers from earlier. In particular, our lambda is equal to lambda one, lambda two, through lambda m. Now this, this diagram on the next slide hopefully illustrates this. So if I wanna to refer to lambda one, I'm asking the question, how many boxes are in row one? And we can see this corresponds to this arrow here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. And, you know, lambda two, we've got four, lambda three, four, and so on. And, you know, this just describes the diagram five, four, four, three, two. And then you can see if we look down here, five, four, four, three, two. So what I'm kind of saying is I'm giving a name to the, the number of boxes in a row, and this is gonna help us later. But already, I mean, if we go back to the start, this lambda i's and lambda j's, we've kind of deciphered them now, right? Because these are just talking about the rows. 
And this J minus I's, these I's and J's just got to do with those indexing. Um, beauty. All right. So now we move on to the left hand side, right? We want to understand what the content of a box is, what the hook of the box is, you know, and this N. So we'll skip forward and look at our first property, which is the hook. So if we have a stack of boxes, and I'm using this stack 54432, each box has something called the hook length. Now the hook length is the number of boxes below to the right and plus one for itself. So if I look at this A here, I'm saying I'm claiming that the hook length of A is equal to nine. But how do we verify this? Well, we look at where A is on this diagram. We count the boxes below it. We count the boxes to the right of it and plus one by itself. So that's nine, right? So we've got four plus four plus one. And it's called the hook length because if we kind of shade in all these boxes, it kind of makes a hook. I don't know if it requires a bit of imagination, but you've got this hook here. And if we look at C below to the right plus one, you've got another hook here. So that C is hook length of C is four. All right, so we've deciphered the hook. Let's move on. The next property, the contents. So labeling the diagonal of a stack of boxes reveals its contents. Now, above the diagonal is good. And good, you know, positive, good vibes, right? Below is bad, it's negative. So we label the main diagonal, this diagonal here, with zeros, right, the neutral. So we have the zero here, above positive and below negative. And we just kind of go up. So we've got the zeros. The next diagonal is going to be the ones. The next diagonal is going to be the twos. And if we go below, we've got the negative ones and negative twos. And this is just the contents. Now, if we want to refer to the contents of a particular box, I mean, luckily we have a formula for that. So we can picture it using these diagonals, but we also can also picture it formally. So if I say, look at this box here, this negative two here, this corresponds to the index four, two. And it says using this formula that I just take the second, uh, the, the, the second coordinate and minus it from the first coordinate. So this is four, two, two minus four, negative two, right? So we have our contents. And we're almost there, really. We just have to look at this kind of ugly thing here. So it's, it looks quite ugly, this lambda i minus lambda j plus j minus i. And if you wanted to remind yourself, it, it corresponds to this right-hand side of the formula, right? Now, it looks ugly, but it's quite cool. It asks something. It says, take your pick of two rows, i and j, and ask yourself, how many steps does it take to get from row i to row j? Now, of course, I mean, what does it mean by steps, right? We're talking about boxes and we're talking about rows. I mean, how do we step? But this should give you some visual intuition for the case in which i, j is equal to four. So we take row one, we take row four, and we walk along this boundary. So I have zero here. This is my starting point, right? I step once, step twice, step three times, four, five times, and I get to this j equals four. And so that means this value, this lambda i minus lambda j plus j minus i is equal to five, right? Because it took me five steps to get from that row one to row four. But conveniently, the idea of taking these steps along this boundary is captured in this formula. So you know what lambda i is, you know what lambda j is. They're just the number of boxes in row i and row j. So we can verify this, right? And you know what j minus i is, or j and i is, because I mean, it's just this thing here, right? i is equal to one, j equals four. So if we walk along the boundary, we get five, but also if we calculated it using this formula, we should also get five, right? So lambda one, we count how many boxes in, lambda, in the first row, one, two, three, four, five, all right? We minus the amount of boxes in the fourth row, one, two, three, so that's two, five minus three is two, plus four is six, minus one is five, right? And so here we get this, this last property. And so we have this idea of what this formula tries to capture. All right, this, this formula here. It says that if we take our diagram of the boxes, we calculate the content, we calculate where the content is the diagonals, we calculate our hooks, you know, remember the hooks, and somehow it's related to these paths along the boundary in a, in a very interesting way. And so, I mean, it's one thing to conjecture it, I'm just kind of telling you all this stuff, but let's try to verify this for a particular example. So I'm gonna take my favorite example, and this is this five, four, four, three, two. This is this shape, right? 
five, four, four, three, two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that this left-hand side is equal to this right-hand side. I try to convince you that this is actually true. So I take my sequence and I calculate the contents and the hooks. Remember the contents we've calculated before. Remember zero is the, the main diagonal, above is good, below is bad, negative. And hooks, we've calculated some of the hooks, but we haven't calculated all of them. Here, I've calculated all of them. So for example, if I look at this number six here, right? There are three below it, three boxes, one, two, three. Two to the right, one, two, and one for itself. Three plus two plus one is six, right? So I've kind of put them, slotted them all in here. So I've almost really calculated this left-hand side. But I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that I've kind of skipped this, this N. So what does this N mean? Well, we need a number N greater than or equal to the size of our sequence. So we say, all right, how many numbers do we have in this, this kind of this stack of boxes? Well, we have more well, five, right? So I need a number greater than or equal to five. Well, to make this simple, I'm just going to take N equals five. But you could have chosen, say, 200, right? So what happens is instead of having contents, I take N and add it to my content, right? That's what this left-hand side of the formula is saying, right? N plus the contents of the box. So I add it to the content. And this should, this should be a, a, a natural step because what happens is we're gonna multiply all these numbers together, right? It's the product of the boxes. And if we have products, involving zeros, I mean, everything's going to disappear because anything times zero is zero. So to make it not trivial, I mean, we, we change all the numbers so they're not zero. All right, so we've got n plus the content. And really, we've just calculated the left-hand side of the formula. So we want to take the product of all these boxes. So we got all these boxes. On top, we have the con n plus the content of the box, right? So we've got all these nice diagonals, but we start at five now. And we, on the bottom, we have the hook length of the boxes, right, according to this. And remember, we're trying to find the product, right? So we want to multiply all these boxes together. And so we just multiply all the numbers together. And we've found the left-hand side of the formula. You know? And in, in practice, this, this equals to something, but we don't really need to know what it equals to, right? You could put this in your calculator, five times six times seven, and you could you know, divide it. And actually it becomes an integer, but it doesn't really matter um, for the moment. All right, we'll calculate the left-hand side. What about the right-hand side? Well, on the right-hand side, remember, we don't have the product over the boxes. We have the product over this iterator. Now, if you're familiar with how iterators work, this should be quite an easy step. But if you're not, you should just take my word that it kind of corresponds to a different kind of picture. And in, in particular, it corresponds to this picture right here. So all this is saying is we're considering numbers between 1 and n, but i has to be less than j. And so we get this diagonal picture here. Um, if you look at the um, hard enough, you, you should be able to convince yourself of this fact. Um, but if not, just take my word. We get a different picture, right? We get this diagonals here. Now we can calculate our things, right? So calculating the right-hand side components, we have this lambda i minus lambda j plus j minus i. Remember, this kind of corresponds to these kind of paths along the boundaries. And we have this j minus i, which is, I mean, you take this, if you have an ij pair, you take the second one minus it from the first. And so we get some more kind of boxes, right? And what we can do is we can calculate the right-hand side. So we have the products over all these boxes again. So we know eventually they're going to have to multiply it to each other. And we're going to find the quotient of them, right? So we have the top corresponding to these uh, boundary lengths and the bottom, j minus i, and we get this thing here. So we've found our left-hand side and we found our right-hand side, but it's not immediately obvious that these two things are equal, right? This thing has a lot of numbers on the left, on the right, there's not that many numbers. It's, there's like an eight on the left-hand side, there's not an eight on the right-hand side. It's kind of, it's not immediately obvious that these things are equal. But let me convince you that they are, right? So we have this left-hand side equal to right-hand side. All right, I don't know if they're equal, but one natural thing to do is to cross-multiply them, right? Because we don't really like you know, dividing by things. So if we cross multiply them, that is we take this red thing at the bottom and put it on the left hand side and the blue thing and put it on the right hand side, we can get this thing here, right? And these colors, by the way, are just to help you um, remember that this comes from the left and this comes from the right. So cross multiply them. And I don't know if you noticed, but something quite special happens. 
I'll let you stare at it for one or two seconds. But can we convince ourselves that these are equal? Well, let's take it row by row. Let's consider this row here. Well, it looks like we found all the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. What about the second row? Ah, oh, I mean, well, the second row, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So it seems like we've, we've counted up these numbers. We've got these factorials, right? What on the right-hand side? All right. So it doesn't really look like it. It looks like we've got a jumbled mess. But if we look closely, all right, we've got a one here, a two here, a three here. And then look over here, there's a four. And on the right hand, there's five. So it, it, we've got all these numbers, six, seven, eight, nine, but they're all jumbled up. And if you look row by row, I mean, we do, we are counting all these numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so if we just unsort them, we get this. And these are definitely equal. This is obvious that it's equal, right? All the numbers on the left are the same on the right. And so if that bottom thing is equal, then this thing on top is equal, which means this, this whole formula must be true, right? And that's, the, that's what this formula does. Using these weird factorials and these kind of ordering of numbers, and I mean, something beautiful happens. We get that the n plus the content of the box divided by the hook length of the box is related to these boundaries. And that is the basis of this integer formula, or this is the formula in general things are going to get a lot more interesting, right? Because we haven't even upgraded yet. We haven't even generalized yet. So let's do it. Let's generalize. I'm going to move it over to Grace to um, go Great. to the next section. So um, our first generalization is to upgrade the integer version to the polynomial version. So previously, um, we have the integer version of the formula. Um, the left-hand side is equal um, is the product over the boxes. The right-hand side is the product over the iterators. Recall that um, from Gypsy's part, the idea of the proof, the equality, is literally just a cross multiplication and the rearrangement. For example, for this specific lambda, um, five four four three two and equal to five. The equality um, <clears throat> follows from the rearrangement of cross multiplication. So the left hand side is product over the boxes in blue. Um, the right hand side is the product of the iterators in red. So if we cross multiply, um, as we see before, they are equal by um, um, just up to rearrangement permutation. And we can upgrade um, uh, integer to polynomial by replacing each number by one minus t to the number. What do I mean by this? I mean, uh, replace one by one minus t to the one, um, and then by two, two by one minus t to the two, and then this nine here, oh, this is eight, and by eight, eight here is one minus t to the eighth, um, and then nine by one minus t to the nine. So, um, so we literally just rewrite each number by one minus t to the number, and by idea of the proof um, rearrangement and a cross multiplication, um, we reaches the um, polynomial version of our theorem. That is, we replace each number, for example, here, n plus the content of the box by one minus n plus t to the n plus content of the box. So we replace hook lines by one minus t to the hook lines and then j minus i by one minus t to the j minus i. So all the number by one minus t to the that number. So the proof, the idea of the proof is the same um, as Gypsy's part, um, just a cross multiplication and the rearrangement. And so we arrived the polynomial version um, of the formula. And then notice that when t approaches to one, the polynomial version collapses to the integer version. Why is this? This is because, this is because as t approaches to one, um, that's interesting. Um, as t, thank you, um, as t approaches to one, one minus t to the k divided by one minus t um, is equal to this expression and then k's term as t uh, approaches to one is equal to k. 
Therefore, um, the idea of, uh, so that's why the polynomial version as t approaches to one collapse to the integer version. This way of generalization is often referred to as the t analog of the theorem because we have the variable t. We can operate it one step further to the QT analog. We have Q variable Q and T, QT analog of the theorem. But before that, we need to um, introduce some concept to rewrite the content of the hook to better prepare us for the next upgrade. So we um, split, uh, we rewrite the content of the hook in terms of arms and co-arms like the collect. So for each box in, in, in our lambda, in our tableau, um, the co-arm is defined the number of boxes to the left of our box. And then similarly, arm is to the right, um, legs is the number of boxes above the box, and the leg is number of boxes below, as indicated in this, this graph. So um, we can rewrite hook lines and content. Recall that hook length is literally just the, the number of boxes indicated here. So that's just equal to arm plus leg, and then we need to include this box with plus one. So hook length can be rewritten as arm plus leg plus one. And a content recall as before, content is equal to j minus i. So j is co-arm plus one, i is co-leg plus one. So content j minus i is just a co r minus co leg, and then, and then the, this is the left hand side of the polynomial version of our formula. Um, so we can rewrite the content and the hook in terms of arms and leg. I just put a content, um, replace content as co r minus co leg here, and the hook lines uh, with co r sorry arm plus leg plus one. So um, our previous polynomial version, uh, the left hand side of it um, can be rewritten as co arms and leg, uh, which prepares us to upgrade into the QT analog, um, also known as elliptic version, uh, which Ivan will talk next. Thank you, Grace. Okay, so previously, um, Grace did this very nice generalization where we go from an integer to a polynomial in terms of t. But who says we have to stop there? So is, it, is there a way to generalize it even more? Well, at the moment, we are talking about polynomial involved, um, that involves only one variable t. Um, but maybe let's introduce a new variable q as well. Okay, so that was the polynomial, polynomial version previously, where we can see we have a variable t. Um, but now, um, since Grace introduced this new terminologies of co-arm and the co-lag and arm and leg, let's use that. So let's look at this power of t. Um, we can split it into two things, uh, a power of q and a power of t. So notice how when q equals to t, we actually collapse back to our previous version. Yeah, so if q equals to t, the sum of the power here will give us the previous exp exponent, and similarly in the denominator here. And on the right-hand side, um, it, it, you might notice that we have a new um, product, we have a new iterator here. Um, well, even though it looks a bit um, it looks a bit fancy, but actually the fraction we have here, notice how they're just consecutive powers. So here we have j minus i plus one, and here we'll just have j minus i. So if we write out all the factors described by this iterator, um, most of them just cancel out. And if we let q equals to t, we again obtain the previous fraction back. So the right-hand side also collapses back, to the previous polynomial version when q equals to t. Okay, so now we have this generalization. Um, let's try to prove this true, right? Um, well, on the right, we have, again, this kind of c fraction there. Um, there's lots of letters going on, but in fact, there's only three variables that truly matters. So the r, the j, and the i. So let me denote this using a different notation. Let me denote it as RK plus AIJ, where capital letter K 
and our alpha here are just symbols. They're not variables, they're, they're just placeholders, symbols. And our three variables that we really care about are the R, I, and J. Okay. So now we can rewrite our the theorem we want to prove in this manner. Um, so I just replaced the right-hand side with that. To help us get a better idea about why on earth is this formula true, um, let us try to use the example earlier to help us. Again, I will try to compute um, each of the factor and kind of organize them nicely in this table. And then we'll start with the right-hand side and try to slowly play around and work our way towards the left-hand side. Okay, so we start with the right hand side, which I'll keep in the corner here. Um, so firstly, let's look at the first iterator. So we're taking all pairs of i, j, such that i is less than j. So the first pair we can take is perhaps 1, 5. When i equals to 1, j equals to 5. If we look at the second iterator, the value of r can be anything between 0 to this expression here. So let's compute the maximum value. Well, lambda i, so lambda one, minus lambda j, which is lambda five, minus one. Well, lambda one is the first term of our sequence, so five. Lambda five is the last term of our sequence, so two. So we have five minus two, and then minus one to give us two. So that means, when i equals to 1 and j equals to 5, the possible values of r are 0, 1, and 2. So let me write them from right to left along the first row. So um, 0 k, is no k, 1 k, and 2 k to represent i equals to 0, 1, 2. Um, moreover, we know i is 1 and j is 5, so um, that's what the subscript of alpha is saying here. And let's do the same thing for the next pair. So let's try i equals to 1, j equals to 4, um, and we obtain some more terms. And we'll keep doing this for all the possible values of i, j, and r. Um, so notice that for each value of i, I put them in the corresponding row. So everything in the first row has value i value 1, and then the second row corresponds to everything with i value 2. And then when we, whenever we fix a row, fix an i, we can kind of have a range of j value. Um, so for those j, uh, range of j value, we write them on different lines um, in descending order, so 5 to 32 and so on. Um, and then for the different values of r, again, we always write them from right to left. So that's why on the right, the most right, the rightmost um, boxes, we always have just alpha, where, which means um, r equals to zero, and we gradually increase them as we go to the left. Um, so yeah, so now we have calculated all the factors that the right-hand side of the formula gave us. Um, so don't forget that that means product. So our expression is just the product of the, all the factors we have written down on this table. Okay, well, yeah, that looks kind of cute, um, but I don't know, I kind of feel like we want to simplify this down even more, what do you think? So let me pick this particular cell, um, alpha 1, 5, and all the way to 1, 2 as an example. And let, let's just try to see if we can simplify this a bit more. Okay, so recall what does our notation mean? This notation just means the fraction here. Okay, so when I have the four terms, four factors in this box, I actually just mean the product of these four fractions. But again, they very nicely just cancel out. They all disappear. Um, so we're actually just left with um, a simpler fraction. So now I can replace that box um, with this fraction here. And we, we can repeat the same thing for every single box. So now we obtain a new box where each each factor um, is a fraction, it's a polynomial fraction. Okay, so we've done some calculation, some simplification. Um, what can we do next? Well, how about we can just try play around. Uh, perhaps we can try to reverse the order of the numerator. 
I don't know, let's just give it a go. Maybe it will help, maybe it wouldn't. Um, so as you can see, I'm keeping the denominators exactly where they were before. The only difference is that I'm rewriting all the numerator in the reverse order and starting from the beginning. So in other words, I'm kind of reflecting the numerators about that central line. Um, so you see how here the order is two, the power of Q is two, one, zero. So when I reverse it, I get zero, one, two. So I'm just reversing the order of the old numerator for every single row. Um, so I have this new table. Now, remember we started from the right-hand side and the expression now I'm having in the corner here is the left-hand side, it's a different side. But you might notice something suspicious is happening. It seems like the term we have already even though we're still missing lots of like numerator denominators here, it seems like what we have already looks very similar to the expression on the left-hand side already. So for instance, recall how co-arm means the left-hand side of your box. So as we go from the left to the right, our co-arm should increase gradually, yeah? So that's indeed what's happening. Let's look at the co-arm, which is the power of Q in the numerator. We have zero, one, two. So it seems like it would be really nice if here it would be one minus Q to the three or something and then four, and we continue this pattern, right? Um, and similarly, if we look at the lag here, so lag is the number of boxes below each cell. Um, and indeed, if we focus on the first column, oh, so we need a denominator. So we'll let's look at this column, here, the third column. Um, so we can see in the bottom box, um, t equals to one, well, this, the lag equals to zero plus one, so that gave us one. As we move from bottom up, our lag is getting longer and longer, and indeed we have one, two, three, four. We're increasing consecutively. So the table we have already, um, at least for the terms we, we have, it seems to be agreeing with this expression here. Now, we want to prove they're equal, right? But clearly at the moment, we're missing lots of things. So in a perfect world, we will have those things. So let's just pretend we're living in a perfect world and let's add the missing numerators and denominators in using our expression at the top here. Okay, but something cool is happening. Notice how the terms we're adding at the bottom or the denominators we're adding are equal to the numerators we're adding. So I can just cancel them out. Yeah, and that will bring me back to the previous product. So, well, since, since um, for a fraction, we're allowed to multiply or divide um, both numerator and denominator by the same factor, and they should still maintain equality. So it seems like, um, in, even in our not so perfect world, uh, we're, still a, we're still allowed to add in all these missing factors um, so that our, our two tables um, from the previous slide and the new slide, they're still equal. Yeah, so we still maintained equality. And indeed, after filling in the missing terms, uh, we now have a table that corresponds exactly to our formula in the corner here. Okay. So that shows that by working from the right-hand side and doing some manipulation, cancel some factors out, simplify it, kind of do some flipping of the numerator, um, somehow we do arrive at the left-hand side of the formula. So at least for this example, we verified that the theorem appears to be true. But now the question of course is, does it always work in general? More precisely, you might be wondering, if we go to the previous page, there we go. In this example, we can clearly see all the additional, additional terms we added in red, they cancel out exactly. But does this, is this a coincidence or does it always happen? Does it always cancel out exactly? Well, um, well thanks so much, it's not a coincidence. Um, because if we look at the power of Q for now, um, in the denominator is 
is arm, and in the numerator, the power is co-arm. So arm and co-arm are kind of like the complement of each other, right? So as we go from the left to the right, co-arm is always increasing and the arm is always getting shorter and shorter. So if we look at the fractions here, um, in the denominator, our arm is getting shorter and shorter, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. But our core arm is getting longer and longer, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And because they're kind of like the complement of each other, um, so it makes sense that they're symmetrical about the middle, right? As one decreases, the other one will increase. So whenever we're adding in this term, they're kind of mirror image. So the powers should be equal. Now, for the power of t, Again, the powers of T has something to do with co-lag and lag. Again, co-lag and lag, they complement of each other. So using that idea with another extra added little twist, um, we can also show they should always be equal. But with that twist, um, I'll leave that as a little challenge for those of you who are interested to think about why um, why the power of t are always the same as well. So you should be thinking about the fact that they're all complements of each other. Um, and yeah, so have a think. Um, it's, yeah, it's not as straightforward as, straightforward as the power of q, um, but it's not too difficult either. Um, so I'll leave, it, leave that either as an interesting challenge for you to think about, or if we have more time in the Q&A session um, after the seminar, um, I'm happy to answer that. Okay. Uh, so we obtain our elliptic version uh, where we have the, um, the co-arm and co like on one side and more fractions on the right hand side. Um, I noticed there were a few questions in the chat. So maybe before I pass on to Grace, I should have a look at them. Uh, why is it called elliptic version? Um, so Grace answered it related to the elliptic, elliptic dimension of L lamb. Oh, so without going into too much, one way I was thinking about it is um, a ellipse, you can kind of think about it having two variables right because it leaves um yeah you need two variables and here in the in this version we also have two variables q and t um so in a very far away sense two variables so it's elliptic version i don't know that's how i try to make sense of it um but perhaps grace can explain it better um after the seminar um yeah so great now i will um pass on to grace to give us a little taste of McDonald's public novels. Great. Um, so now we have um, arrived our last upgrade, um, the taste of McDonald's polynomial, which put our previous three um, formula, um, integer polynomial and the elliptic version, um, into a unifying framework. Previously, we have elliptic version, polynomial version, and integer version. Um, and recall that when Q is equal to T, the elliptic version collapses to the polynomial version. And uh, as T approaches to one, polynomial version collapses to the integer version. And we can stay, uh, take a step forward to view them in the framework of McDonald polynomial and the symmetric functions. Symmetric functions are functions that remain the same when interchanging variables. Some noteworthy examples are elementary symmetric functions. Um, for example, e2, x1, x2, x3 is x1, x2, x1, x3, x2, x3. Um, this is symmetric. Um, another example of symmetric function is monomial. Um, as you can see, 3, 1, 1, uh, this is a symmetric. Um, and symmetric function, um, the families of symmetric function um, is unified by um, McDonald polynomial. So McDonald polynomial was introduced by E. N. G. McDonald in 1987, which generalizes many symmetric functions. So we denote um, McDonald polynomial by P lambda x1 to xn qt. For example, as t is equal to one, the McDonald, 
McDonald polynomial reduces to monomial symmetric functions, M lambda. And as Q is equal to T, uh, McDonald polynomial reduces to the short functions, S lambda. And this function, function we will introduce, um, and we will, we will mention it later. Um, so let's consider a specialization of McDonald polynomial. By specialization, I mean I replace this x1 to xn by 1t t square to t n minus 1 qt. Um, this is called specialization. So for convenience, I will just denote, um, omit this t and then just denote this, this specialization as p lambda qt. So why do we want the specialization? So it is the specializations of McDonald polynomial, this p lambda qt, that that provides a framework to unify the previous three formula we have before. To be specific, um, this P lambda QT, the specializations of McDonald polynomial, is related to elliptic version up to a factor of T. Um, and uh, as you may recall, as T is equal to Q is equal to T, the elliptic version collapses to the polynomial version. And indeed, indeed, as P lambda QT, when Q is equal to T, TT is equal to the um, short function when you specialize, specialize the short function, um, as you may recall, as I mentioned before. And indeed, this short function is equal to um, the polynomial version of the formula up to a factor of T. Um, and uh, you may recall, as before, um, polynomial version as T approaches to one collapse to the integer version. Um, and indeed, the short function um, when you have t approaches to one, um, the short function one on one s lambda one on one is equal to the integer version of our formula. First, um, we can view these three formula, um, elliptic version, polynomial version, integer version, in the framework of McDonald specialized McDonald polynomial p lambda qt. Um, this is the final upgrade. So in fact, um, we can visualize such generalization um, in QT square. So this is a Q axis and this is T axis because we have two variable Q and T. Um, and our elliptic version, oh, this is one and this is one. And um, our elliptic version um, is a general point in this square. And then our polynomial version as Q um, is equal to T is this line through origin with slope one. And as t approaches to one, um, this is integer version. And this QT square not only capture our three formula, also we can capture a lot of our symmetric uh, polynomials in our um, QT square. So recall that elliptic version um, of our formula is the specialized McDonald polynomial. Um, and then when Q is equal to t, um, this is the short function. And uh, um, we can see a lot of um, symmetric polynomials in this QT square. For example, as t is equal to one, um, it's McDonald polynomial reduces to monomials. And then um, as um, you can see the, the elementary uh, symmetric function, E lambda prime um, is captured in this um, when Q is equal to one. You don't have to know all this, it's just to, to illustrate how wonderful this picture is. Um, and then how little would function is when Q is equal to zero and then Q Wittiger function is when T is equal to zero, as you can see in the bottom line here. And as, um, as we approach this one one in different paths, uh, we get the Jack polynomial. Um, so just contemplate on this amazing QT square of McDonald polynomial and then um, how it unifies um, the family of um, symmetric functions, of symmetric polynomials. It's just uh, really amazing, right? Yes. Um, so hopefully our talk inspire um, some of the interest from the audience to learn about McDonald polynomial and the related area. Um, and here are some friends. Um, if you're interested. So the first the reference, um, if you're interested in our talk, um, is the principal specializations of McDonald polynomial is 
and, and this is the link to the website um, of Arun. Um, and then you can see a lot of um, McDonald polynomial um, seminar YouTube videos um, on this website. The second reference, if you're really interested, is called Symmetric Functions and the Hall Polynomials by Ian MacDonald. It's the Bible of studying MacDonald polynomial. And here is the reference link to the PDF if you're interested. Um, right. Um, so all three of us would um, love to um, express our greatest uh, gratitude to um, Arun Ram, who introduces three of us to the amazing area um, of McDonald polynomial of mass. And then we enjoy our meeting and discussion with Arun deeply. And we really enjoy uh, our collaboration. What? Okay. Um, and I would like to thank the audience for attendance and attention. And I thanks mom for the organization. Um, and this concludes our talk. And I will give it back to Kwong.